And I'm going to be interviewing our real President Donald J. Trump. Mail-in ballots are a disaster. They basically use COVID-19 or the China virus mm -hmm. to rig the election. And it was very sad when Mike Pence yeah. gave those votes over because when you have more votes than you have voters, when you have other things that are so wrong... That's former President Donald Trump decked out in a tuxedo spouting his usual election lies to the pillow guy, Mike Lindell, for an extended interview that was posted to Lindell's social media. A dressy and dishonest airing of grievances. My goodness, is it Festivus again already? It's easy to laugh at these people, and we should. They're ridiculous. But the threat to our civil society is dead serious. Trump is the de facto leader of the Republican Party. He's their top candidate for president in 2024. And Mike Lindell still speaks to packed crowds and sells lots of pillows, somehow. Ten months after the insurrection and hang Mike Pence, these self-absorbed men and their lies still abound. And so does the danger. We saw evidence of that yesterday in the House where 207 out of 209 Republicans would not censure Arizona GOP Congressman Paul Gosar for tweeting out an animated video depicting him killing Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and attacking the president, Joe Biden, with a sword. It was a joke, he said. He deleted it, even though he meant no harm. And yet, moments after the vote to censure, Gosar reposted the video that had caused it all, the video depicting him murdering a congressional colleague. Why is it that people in positions of power so often seem to be the worst people you could give power to? It's not just a problem here in the US. From Hungary to India to Belarus to the Philippines and beyond, much of the world is increasingly under the thrall of charismatic and capricious authoritarians. Those of you who watch this show regularly know I'm obsessed with this issue of autocracy and of Republican Party neo-fascism. One of the people who's made a career out of thinking about these trends is Brian Class. The Oxford-trained political scientist is an expert on democracy and authoritarianism. His field research includes interviews with presidents, rebels, coup plotters and dissidents around the world, from America to Zambia. And he brings it all together in a new book, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us. In it, Class uses new and old psychological and political research as well as case studies of shipwrecked teenagers, tyrannical homeowners associations and renegade school maintenance workers to plumb the nature of human leadership and corruption. It's not just about our political leaders, it's about our bosses, our PTA presidents and our own evolutionary programming. The book asks, do worse people get power? Does power make people worse? And how can we ensure that incorruptible people get into power and wield it justly? Nothing heavy, right? Provocatively, Class says there are reasons, both genetic and cultural, for why and how we choose those who lead us. And he says we have critical lessons to learn if we want better institutions and fewer kleptocrats and authoritarians in control of our day-to-day -day lives. Earlier, I spoke to him about his new book. Brian, your new book opens with a question. Does power corrupt or are corrupt people drawn to power? For our viewers who haven't read your book yet, can you give us a sense of your answer to that question? Yeah, so the answer is, is both. Um, what I did in this book is I looked at uh, how dictators' personalities, the things that I've studied of despots and authoritarian rulers around the world, trickle down into our communities, into our businesses, and whether there is a trend in which corruptible people are more drawn to power. The answer is that power does corrupt, but actually that's one of the least interesting and one of the smallest aspects of how power affects people. What I think is one of the big takeaways from the book is that the wrong kind of people are drawn to power like moths to a flame, and that you can either counteract that with good systems or you can encourage that with bad systems. And I think one of the problems in modern society is that we have too many systems that amplify that tendency of human nature to draw the worst people into positions yes. of authority. And I have to ask you this, Brian, the new book is called Corruptible. It's about why we so often seem to have these worst people in positions of authority. It's 320 pages long, and there is not a single mention of the name Trump in this book. That seems tough to pull off. Was that a conscious choice on your part? It was a conscious choice because I think, you know, we live in a super divided society right now. And I think one of the things that I wanted to achieve with this book is to say that regardless of political divides, most Americans actually agree that the people in charge are not our best. 
that in fact, we have a lot of dysfunctional people in charge. You know, whenever I talk to people, they say, why is it that all the people I know, you know, my friends and family members are good and decent. And when I look at the person who's in charge of, you know, my congressional district or my homeowners association or my boss's boss, they're awful or abusive. And I think the lessons are universal in this book. So what I tried to do was to avoid some of the more hot button issues that divide us and present universal aspects of how power functions so that even people who disagree strongly with me about Donald Trump might take away some lessons and implement them in a way that will build better leaders for the United States and beyond. I wish you good luck in that particular endeavor. But let me ask you one Trump-related question. Uh, you talk about the dark triad in your book, this trifecta of Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy that the worst leaders exhibit. And of course, my mind again goes to Trump. Uh, but I want to ask you about the comical absurdity of some of these strongmen, including Trump. We're used to thinking of dictators, demagogues as having only a dark streak, like Hitler or even a Putin or Orban today, very serious, very Dower. Trump is so comedic that even when he's saying very dangerous things, a lot of us, my, myself included, are tweeting, well, he's wearing a tux, talking to a guy who sells pillows. This is hilarious. But it's also dangerous. And I wonder, what do you think about those biases we have that favor such people, that favor such authoritarians, even if they are comical authoritarians? It's a great point that you're making, because I think one of the things I try to do in the book is to turn the mirror back on society and say, OK, we all know that our leaders are often awful. So why do we pick them? Why do we allow them to lead us? And that has more to do with us than it does with them. And I think the comedy is part of that. It takes the edge off, right? So nobody wants to follow a strong man who appears to be a strong man in modern America. I mean, the idea of being a devotee of Trump, the authoritarian, is not as Trump the amusing authoritarian, right? And so I think he uses yeah. that to great effect to try to keep, as you say, take the edge off of him. But it's just as dangerous. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting is that term strongman is no accident. One of the studies that I explore in the book looks at how during times of crisis, real or imagined, we gravitate towards yeah. leaders who tend to be overconfident, yes. large men. And this is embedded in Stone Age biases that we have that linger over from literally hundreds of thousands of years ago where there might have been an evolutionary advantage based on size. And so, you know, this is why Vladimir Putin takes his shirt off. It's why Trump says American carnage and I alone can fix it. And for a subset yeah. of our population, those messages are extremely seductive. So I think one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this book was why yeah. is it that we are seduced? And the only way to counteract Act that seduction is to acknowledge that it exists in some of us so that we can start to think more rationally about the leaders that we pick. It's, it's such a good point about the ancient biases. Although I would add, to be fair to Trump, he is smart enough not to take his top off a la Vladimir Putin. I'm not sure that would work in his favor. Brian, when you look at what happened in Congress this week, Paul Gosar, Republican congressman, tweets this ghastly, I don't know, snuff video out. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy defends him. And immediately after the censure vote, in, all, in which every Republican bar Kinzinger and Cheney votes with Gosar, Gosar goes out and retweets the offending video again. Is there any hope at this point of stopping the Republican Party in America from becoming a full-on 24-7 authoritarian neo-fascist political grouping, or are we too far gone? I'm really pessimistic in the short to medium term. I think that there are very few avenues that could counteract the trends that are happening in the Republican Party right now. But what I'm really worried about that we're not talking enough about, I think, and that you know echoes a lot of the themes in the book, is what happens when people like Gosar are the people that we see in positions of power? What happens when they get a slap on the wrist or they get away with it altogether? And the answer is that when people are looking at the idea of going into politics, you know, power hungry people are gonna go for it no matter what, they want to. They, the, the worst of our society is drawn to power for power's sake. The best of our society weighs up the costs and benefits. And when they see somebody like Gosar tweeting out a video depicting murder of one of the colleagues in Congress and really, you know, being given a free pass by his colleagues, that's going to deter good and decent people from running from office. The same is true, by the way, with all those yes, videos yes. of school board members who are facing death threats for promoting public health advice. I mean, if you want to help your kid's school district and you have to think, well, you know, I don't really want to spend all this much time and I don't really care about the power. I just want to help. 
But on the negative side, you're going to get harassed and possibly face death threats. I mean, you're just going to bow out. So I'm, what I'm really worried about is the Republican Party is going over the brink, not just where it's beyond rescue in terms of authoritarianism, but actually in terms of how it's socializing the political culture for the next generation. Because as bad as these people are, the people yeah. who look up to Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene are very likely to be worse in the future. And that's something that's profoundly, profoundly depressing, but it's something we need to grapple with. It's a very good point, but as you say, it's also a very depressing point. The book is Corruptible. Brian Glass, thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.